Einstein showed us that time <laughs> is relative. Mick Jagger promised us that time was on his, my, our side. I think of Justin Cronin as some strange mix of these two thinkers. He assures me that he is maniacally overprepared, as usual, and his talk this morning will focus on the complexities of point of view. He will, in all, he will as well talk to us about how writers shape time. Compress it, stretch it, roll it, warp it, stop it, recover it, and at their most apocalyptic, pretend, but only pretend, to end it. Justin Cronin. I tuned, I turned, am I on? Okay. Yeah. Dave made some big promises there, didn't he? All right. Um, yeah, I am a little bit overprepared. So I'm going to, I have a 40 page craft talk here. Um, and um, so uh, this morning over breakfast, I edited out a few things. And I, I honestly don't know how far I'm going to get. And that, you know, the place that I don't get to, I'll just, I'll just give it to my students in room 109, I suppose. Um, so welcome to the fourth installment in my Auto Repairs for Dummies Craft Talk series. Those of you who have, been, uh, who have been here before will know what I mean. The problem that's faced by all of us on the faculty is that, in fact, that so many of you return year after year that we have to think of new things to say. And this is especially troublesome in my case, as in the last couple of years, I, I pretty much spent the whole billfold. Uh, they also put these things on the internet, and I, so even if you weren't here, I'm sure many of you have actually have gone to the website and looked at some of the craft talks. However, for those of you who might not have been here or who do not have a fast internet connection, I will briefly summarize my last three craft talks. <laughs> three acts, two plot points, put your verbs in order, and please make them transitive. Okay? That's pretty much what it all boiled down to. All right, now that we're clear on that, we can move on to this morning's woefully programmatic subject. And I'm going to skip a page right there. I am, as many of you know, drawn to these simple things, the stuff my writing teachers, for some reason, didn't bother to tell me. So in thinking about this year's craft talk, I went and looked at a few stories by a young writer, somebody in college, to see the kind of mistakes that I might find. What I saw was what a lot of teachers see in their better students' work some ambition, some talent, a certain feel for language, a certain amount of silliness. One of the stories was out and out stupid about a robot waiter. And a few nice moments, especially in a rather quiet love story set at college that ended with the narrator, <clears throat> an alter ego for the writer, dancing not with his beloved but with a group of Harry Krishnas on the Boston Common. It was a nice little bit of bait and switch. But the thing that jumped right off the page at me was the fact that the writer had no idea really what he was doing. You could see that he had a feel for it, a rough intuitive sense of the enterprise, but he didn't actually consciously know. And the fact that he didn't know was evident in just about every sentence. That's because he didn't understand, ta-da, point of view, the most basic structural aspect of any fiction. In other words, he knew what a story was but not when it meant to tell one. That was my box of college stories shortly before I destroyed them during my last move, OK? Um, yes, I am the author of The Robot Waiter. Um, so here is this morning's subject, Mysteries of Point of View Revealed. Um, <clears throat> All right, so uh, what do we mean when we talk about point of view? <clears throat> First of all, point of view is just another way of saying the narrator. But in actual use, the terms aren't really interchangeable because the narrator is most often used to refer to an actual person, either a first-person narrator, somebody inside a story telling it, or the kind of chatty, omniscient, 
third-person narrator one finds in fiction by people who wore top hats. In Dickens, for instance, the narrator was either a character, somebody inside the tale, or Dickens himself, who made no pretense that there existed any kind of formal narrative buffer between him and the story that he was telling. So the narrator as a term is one that I will use, but it becomes a little bit confusing because we tend to think of it as, a, as, as, as an actual human being. So a good general definition would be this. And those of you who have heard my craft talks before know that I like to like, like throw out these big axioms. And this is, of course, is way too long. So you're going to start to write it down, and then you'll get lost, and I'll have to repeat it. And it'll be really awkward, OK? Um, good general definition of point of view. It's a distinct intelligence that grants us, and that's, for, that's both writers and readers, grants us access to the imagined reality of a fictive world. It is, in essence, a mind created for the sole purpose of telling a tale and like any mind, it is carved into time and space in a manner that is singular and measurable and governed by any of several particular natures chosen by the writer. Now, did you lose the thread there? Yeah, so did I, OK? But that's what it is. I'll go back and hit the major points. It's a distinct intelligence that grants us access to the imagined reality of a fictive world. And because it is a distinctive intelligence, it is something that exists. It has temporal and spatial properties that you choose as a writer. You choose what they are, and then you have to live by those choices. <coughs> Graphically, here's a representation of the whole principle from both the writer's and the reader's point of view. All right. In other words, the point of view is a kind of mediator. Right? Between the story and the person who is writing it, the writer constructs a point of view. It's a sort of lens through which he gets access or she gets access to the story they wish to tell. And the same is true for the reader. Everything that comes out of the story comes through the same lens to the person who is reading the story. So I've taken some basic stuff here and actually made it complicated, but I kind of had to. I'll go back to that box of awful stories that I wrote in college. What made each sentence in those stories, and this is what I decided about them, what made each sentence in those stories not quite the sentences that they should have been, every single sentence, was a lack of conscious awareness, awareness on my part as the writer that the story had to be told in a particular way because of the point of view that I had chosen at the very start. In one case, that terrible story with the robot, I hadn't actually chosen a point of view at all i just kind of written the thing. I think I did it at like 2 in the morning, too. I'd written it in what passed for something like omniscience. But even then, it was just sort of all over the place. So that's my first point. Point of view is a choice. It's the first choice that you make. Whatever story you want to write, you choose a point of view before you choose just about anything else, because it's your way of seeing it, first of all. And second of all, making the right language to tell it. So the big thing on the board. I'm betting most of you groaned a little bit when you saw this, because a great deal of it is familiar, or it should be. Probably the right side, with a few exceptions, feels like old hat, because this stuff gets pretty much covered you know, even in high school, first and third and blah, blah, blah. But my bet is that the left side isn't anything you've ever thought about in conjunction with point of view. And that's where I fouled up as a writer for years. And most of my students still do, and in fact, all of the students who gave me manuscripts for this conference did. <coughs> right? Everybody made mistakes with this stuff. It, everybody does. It's, it's ubiquitous. I'll say it again. Point of view exists in space and time. Those of you who were here last year to hear my full gospel of time, and I do have one, may want to leave now. And I guess I couldn't blame you. But for years, I struggled as a writer because I didn't understand this fundamental principle, that all narrative artistry because it's about the creation of an artificial reality in which meaningful change occurs, depends upon a controlled relationship to time, the creation of the feeling of the flow of time. And this is true, therefore, of point of view. I'm going to be treating this thing on the board as a kind of menu. And I'm going to do the easy stuff first, which is the right side, talking a little bit about the implications of each of these choices that you might make. So I'll start with first person narrative and what it is. The fact is, everybody knows what this is. A narrative in first person is one that is told by a character in the story, hence the reference to the first person pronoun I, which will appear everywhere and quite usefully in such a text. I sometimes have students who write a first person story, and they come to me, and they're worried because the word I appears everywhere. 
they feel like there's too much I and stuff. Like, it's first person, relax. That's the word we need. <laughs> Stories and novels would do well to announce their points of view right away. And here is a marvelously clear and uh, illustrative first sentence from a first person story. So I'm gonna, I kind of need to erase, I'll erase my own stuff. <clears throat> Some of you will recognize this. Anybody recognize this sentence? My name is Luke Ripley, and here is what I call my life. It's the first sentence of a story called A Father Story by Andre Debuse. A Father Story by Andre Debuse. In my class will probably use the actual story. I love this sentence. It's one of my all-time favorite first sentences because it does exactly what a first sentence should do in any kind of writing. It tells you what the point of view will be, first of all. You cannot miss it. And why that point of view has been chosen. My name is Luke Ripley, and here is what I call my life. First-person narration is by nature, and when you choose it, this is the choice you are making, a kind of testimony or a confession. Whoever is talking, that person owns the story. They're telling you who they are, and they are de facto not only the point of view, but also the main character. They're instantly promoted to main character status. I'll borrow from Lee here, who borrows from, from James, but I think of them as the stout stake around the rich, which the rest of the story must flow. But there's something else to consider that isn't obvious, and I think may, probably many of you haven't, because I didn't for years. First person narration actually has three distinct forms. I didn't list them there, I don't know, just, just to be perverse. This fellow Luke Ripley, there are three things he might be doing. Is he writing? Is he speaking, or is he doing something else? You can't know yet, based on that sentence. But you must eventually, because a Luke Ripley who is writing something is very different from a Luke Ripley who is talking to someone, you, over a couple of whiskeys, I guess. He's different, too, from that something else I mentioned and that I will get to in a moment, because we need to give that a little definition. The written and spoken forms of first-person narr narration are, in fact, the exception to the general rule. A written narrative, say something in the epistolary form, fiction that takes the form of letters, usually announces itself right away. And its most salient feature is the matter of audience. It's written to somebody, and we are merely reading over their shoulder. An example of the epistolary first person would be the novel 84 Charing Cross Road. Do people know this book? It's made into a movie, too. Most of you, more of you probably know the movie than the book, which takes the forms of a, form of a series of letters exchanged by a woman writer in New York and the owners of a British bookshop. They're strangers when the thing begins, and by the course of the novel, you know, decades have, over the course of it, it's a very slender book, but decades have passed, and they've gotten to know one another, and I think they've never actually even physically met. The parties involved are really speaking to each other. Much of the speech is actually quite formal, as it would be in a letter. And I think of the epistolary form as a sort of high register form of first person narrative. But that means there's not much of the inner life there unless you read between the lines, which you are, of course, meant to do. <clears throat> other written narrative forms, first person forms, include things like diaries, whether fictional or not, or not. Diary of Anne Frank, for instance, in which the audience is the private self or some more exotic tricks like the one pulled in Margaret Atwood's novel, The Handmaid's Tale. Does some of you know this novel? It, used to, it was a huge bestseller maybe 15 years ago. It's, it's an anti-utopian novel that reveals itself at the end, and I think I'm remembering this correctly, to be um, the section of somebody's dissertation. It's a novel that takes place in the future, but it turns out that future is actually somebody else's past. It's a huge like trick that she pulls at the end, and, and in fact, it's, it's for some readers, that trick is kind of deflates the whole enterprise. Spoken first person is like pornography, something that's hard to define but easy to recognize because it has the inflected feel of spoken speech. We start to read it with our ears. Huck Finn, of course, is the mother of all examples, and I kind of use that as the template. But I'd also put other novels like Catcher in the Rye on the pile. That really feels as if it's coming out of somebody's mouth. <clears throat> 
But most first-person narrative is neither written, i.e., having that kind of high, highly formal property, or spoken, which tends to have highly informal quality. Most of it is something else, as Luke Ripley's narrative is something else. In fact, Luke Ripley's story turns out by the end to be something like a kind of prayer. And I think that this is instructive. It literally becomes a prayer by the end of the story. Prayer is the sending of the mind outward. What, you might be a person who believes he knows where such thoughts go and why, or you might not, but I think we could probably all agree that prayers are in some way a coherent transmission of the mind sent away from the self. In other words, they are silent testimony that uses language. So that's how I think of most first-person narration, as a kind of prayer, or the, this is the term I generally use because it feels more secular, you know, <laughs> transmission of an intelligence. One being's thoughts beamed into the great cosmic brain, whoever you think owns that, overheard by an individual reader. So it's not something that's written, doesn't have that formal quality, it, it's not something that's spoken, doesn't have that inflected quality, but it is the, the, the true language of a mind being sent outward into, presumably into our brain. The last thing I'll say about first person narration is that it's only one story you might choose out of a given fictive circumstances. When you imagine a first person story, you tend to only see one story because that one point of view kind of locks you into one. And this can be sometimes a mistake or at least a lost opportunity. I'll use the debut story as an example, and to do that I need to briefly summarize the plot. Most of you don't know the story, so I'll, I'll, I'll give you a few details. Luke Ripley, this man, he lives alone and he, he uh, runs a stable. He raises horses and he teaches riding. <clears throat> he's divorced, but celibate because he's an ardent Catholic. He doesn't really believe he's divorced. His best friend is a priest with whom he rides and drinks. He has a college-age daughter whom he adores and who spends most of, his, most of the summers with him. That's the general circumstance of the story. One summer evening, his daughter, the girl, goes out with friends. They drink a bunch of beers. We don't see this, but we know about it. And the girl drives home. On the way home, she hits and kills a man on a lonely road. She panics, doesn't stop, drives straight home to her father in tears, completely, you know, a mess, and tells him what has happened as best as she can tell, which is sudden figure, whoomp, I just hit the gas, I'm sorry. He has to decide what to do, and he does, but I won't tell you what, because it doesn't help my discussion, and you might want to go read the story, and it's very, very interesting what he chooses to do. That's the rough material of the story. That's what I call the fictive circumstance. All right? If you see it through Debuse's eyes, what you see is what he wrote, which is a father's story. That's the story he pulled out of it. It's about what it means to be not just this father, but a father in general. But there are other choices he might have made out of the same circumstances. For instance, a daughter's story. Right? Instantly, she would become the main character, and so we'd be seeing the father-daughter relationship in reverse. It would, this, such a story would be told in her voice. But more importantly, we would be seeing different actual events. And this is what I like about this story, is because it's essentially a crime story. There's something that happens that we don't see. Other people see it. Everybody's got half the information. Right? If you write this as a daughter story, you get the other half. We actually see the accident, for instance. We know how many beers she's had. That's kind of ambiguous. We know how drunk she may or may not be. But when her father returns alone to the accident scene, as he does, he leaves her at home and goes out to find what has happened. Right? We can't go. In the father's story, that's the whole point. That's the journey we take. This story, we would stay at home with the daughter. We could only hear about it later and what he might tell her about it might not be the truth, and in fact, it won't be. She might guess the truth, but she and the story can't know the truth in the same way that the story Debus wrote doesn't know how negligent his daughter really was. He doesn't really know the exact nature of her mistake. Totally different story, same set of circumstances. Here's another one, an ex-wife's story. Sort of odd, but she is a character in Debus's version and an important one. The story of their marriage and their painful divorce is very much part of the material and it's given in extensive backstory. So how would she get access to the story of the accident, assuming that we wanted to write it from the same material from her point of view? Well, perhaps the daughter tells her, so it's the daughter's version, or her ex-husband does his version. 
But in either case, all of the information would be secondhand, thus shifting the emphasis away from the accident itself and the father-daughter relationship to the girl's mother and her feelings about her daughter, her husband, her ex-husband, and her life. I would imagine in such a story, this whole business about the accident would be, in a sense, in the background to another story that the writer might find. It would become sort of supporting material for something else. You could write the priest story. Remember him? His best friend is a priest. How would he get access to this? It's obvious. How would he get access? Confession. Confession. Yeah, it's obvious, right? In fact, it's the, the decision for the, the Luke Ripley's decision not to take confession, ultimately, in the story is, is part of it. So as you can see, there's any number of different ways into the story each time it becomes a different story. The mistake most writers make, I think, at the imaginative level is when they imagine a first-person story, they never, ever consider what other point of view might operate in the story and provide even better material. All right. That's first person. It's a little more complicated, perhaps, than you thought, if you think of it in these terms, with these kinds of choices you're actually making. Now, second person narrative. I had to kind of put this on the list because it exists, but the truth is it's kind of a shallow trick at best. And with apologies to any of you who've written second person narrative, I have never actually done it for more than you know, a sentence or two because uh, I don't know, it just, it just, it just it sort of didn't take with me. Uh, do people know how this works, second person narrative? You don't see it very often. You, that's right, the main character is you. That's right, the main character, you. It's basically a third person with the pronouns replaced. Really, you could just go and do the global replace, right? And kind of quickly turn a third person into a second person story if you want. Now, but the effect of this, what sounds like a minor adjustment, is actually pretty profound. Essentially, the main character and narrative consciousness of the story, right, that, that mind, right, is, a manufact is manufactured as a compound being, right? It's a composite of the reader, you, right, and some invented person. In other words, the reader is refashioned into a character in the story. You don't get to be yourself anymore, exactly. Examples of second person are, I think, deservedly rare, rare. And I'll give you a sentence, I'll put a sentence on the board that'll sort of show you why. Again, some of you may recognize it, although it is a paraphrase. I couldn't find the actual book. It's a paraphrase of the first sentence of a novel that made a kind of a, a splash in the early 80s in the heydays of minimalism. She's mouthing it. What is it? Bright Lights, Big City, right? Uh, who knows this book? Quick poll. I'm really shocked. I, you know, I'm surprised anybody does, you know? Um, when I asked that question to a room full of students 10 years ago, three quarters of the room easily raised their hands, and now nobody raises their hands, which tells you a little bit about the book. It doesn't mean it's a bad book, because in some ways it's sort of interesting. It got, the book had a lot of tomatoes thrown at it that I think it ultimately did not deserve. But it was just, it was sort of a gag book. I mean, it really is a sort of one joke book. And those really never last. So this book is you know, kind of quietly slipping away. But here's how, the, here's how it worked. This was the book's appeal. And this is what gave it this sort of quality of being a novelty item. You, the reader, are the main character of the novel. You are also for the duration of reading it, a young man in his 20s working for a slick magazine in New York City that is rather obviously the New Yorker. I think it's called, you know, Gotham or something. Right? <laughs> you are recently abandoned by your very pretty wife. You are grieving the death of your mother from cancer, which you don't really talk about. And you are nursing a colossal cocaine habit in good early 80s fashion. In fact, the woman you are sitting in the bar with, when the story opens, the novel opens, has a shaved head, and together you have recently snorted several lines of the, the novel's signature idiom, Bolivian marching powder, off the tank of the ladies' room toilet. Across the length of the novel, this is what you will do. You will do more cocaine, you will screw up at work, you will get fired, you will do even more cocaine, you will hunt down your wife and do some cocaine, and generally make a public nuisance of yourself until coming to terms with your dead mother. That's the book. In other words, the you of the story is the reader in structural terms only. In every other way, the story's main character is a distinct 
invented person showing no particular attributes with the reader at all. It's unavoidable. You have a name. Your name is Jamie in the book. So the question, why bother with this if it's really just kind of third person in drag, in pronoun drag? And the answer is most of the time, nearly all the time, is you probably shouldn't bother. It's cumbersome as hell, and some readers, most of them, I think, simply won't make the leap. Others will kind of edit as they go. And I think readers are the last line of editing of any text, you know? And some readers will just kind of edit as they go, seeing the word you, but really hearing he or she, which is doable, but it's a nuisance, and they won't really like it. The only reason to do something like this, to write in second person, is for that last group of readers for whom this has a kind of real lapel-grabbing immediacy. For some people, you know, this simply works. The you squeezes out a kind of instant psychological glue attaching them to the main character's experience and fate. In other words, it makes empathy the effect that all narration tries to create. So it can work. It just usually doesn't or it works at far too high a cost. Right? Second person. I had to include it. I don't recommend it, but there it is. Which brings me to the mother of all narrations. Right? Third person. This is where people start to have problems. First person probably accounts for, and this is, this is like the most ridiculous statistical guess I've ever made. First person probably accounts for 30% of all the fictive narrative that gets written out there. The other 70%, give or take a few percent for the weird stuff, right? like second, is third. So how come? What is the special power of third? I don't think there's any one answer, but I think it comes down to this. Third person adds a distinct mediating intelligence, a narrator, that you, the writer, need for most of the stories that you want to tell. Especially in the short story, which relies so heavily on economy and compression, an independent narrator is a kind of built-in editor that can give the fiction speed and emphasis and shapeliness. We all know what it's like to write a first-person story that simply gets carried away by voice. Blah, 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 blah. You can kind of get drunk on it. Or the problem of a narrator who isn't really up to the task of telling the truth, either because they're liars, or not very bright, or four years old, <laughs> or not even human, right? As in, say, Watership Down, a wonderful novel I enjoyed as a child in which all the characters are very articulate rabbits. In fact, very few characters make good narrators. Not everybody is supposed to be in management. <laughs> All right? So for their stories, which are most of them, not Luke Ripley. You know, the guy is up to the task. But for everybody else, you need the extra storytelling mind of third person. Now I'm going to go back to that box of stories, my awful stories for a second, and the robot butler. <clears throat> As wise as I was to choose third person for that story, which I did, it got me into trouble. First person, especially for a new writer, is easy. First of all, it's just you talking when you're you know, sort of writing for the first time. And you're generally talking about yourself, as I did, a subject in which I considered myself an absolute expert. You know? But third person isn't just one kind of narration, as you can see. We've got A, B, C, D. It's actually four or even five or six when you consider all the permutations, and there's, there's more than I'm actually covering today. The trap I fell into most of the time as a new writer, and one that I sometimes still do, is in fact the same one that got all mankind kicked out of paradise. Right? It's the trap of omniscience. So I'll start with third person omniscience. Third person omniscient narrative is something we're all acquainted with, and most of you probably know even the Latin meaning of it, right? Anybody here get, go to Catholic school, omniscient, right? All knowing. Third person omniscient narrative is, to my way of thinking, a very greedy and egotistical way to tell a story, and thus should be handled with tremendous care. The narrative intelligence exists outside the story, as third person narratives all do. The narrator is outside the story. But it also exists outside of all normally human parameters, because it's not attached to any character in particular. 
It has a godlike license to move through all time and space as it chooses, through the minds and memories of all characters in its creation, and generally articulate its opinions about the same, which very rarely can it refrain from doing. <laughs> Such a narrator can tell us what any character is thinking at any moment. It can move from room to room at will, comment on the action, and boss the reader around by telling her what to think or not. Does this sound like fun? It is, and that's the problem. Now, uh, there's a handout. Everybody get the handout with all these bad sentences? Okay. First of all, one of the things is when I construct sentences to demonstrate a point, I try not to cloud the point with what you would call like artistry. All right? This stuff is very flat-footed. Do not take it as examples of good writing. These are just examples of point-of-view deployments. All right? So the first one that you have there is an example of a sentence beginning a story in third omniscient. And Every writing that you do should, you know, the fir your first task as a writer is always to make it clear what the point of view will be. If the reader doesn't know, the reader has no idea how to take anything, all right? So here is the first couple of sentences of a story that makes it very clear in every way that this will be an omniscient narrative. Frank was a stupid man, though he thought he was a clever man, and while he stood in the yard that fateful Sunday, watering his petunias and admiring them, he had no idea, although the story does, that across town his wife, the lovely Alicia, I guess somebody thinks she's lovely, was at that moment plotting to kill him with a hammer. All right? <laughs> Good first person opening. It's, you know, it gives us a location. We've got a couple characters, lots of information. We know the weather. We know the day of the week. Right? But we get lots of other stuff. Right? You can see what's omniscient about it, in other words, the narrative goes everywhere, and it's very rich in tone. It knows the future, and when something knows the future, de facto it knows the past, everybody's past. It's in two places at once, and it's in two minds at once. It's outside with Frank, it's over with Alicia, and in fact it knows her intentions, and it knows what Frank is thinking. Right? It also tells us what to think of Frank, that he's stupid, and that he has deceived himself. Right? So all of the information is coming from somewhere else. It's coming from a narrator, somebody who stands outside the story. In other words, it's coming from God. You have to decide how you feel about the reliability of that intelligence. All right? So a word of caution that I wish someone had given me before I wrote that stupid robot butler story. Absolute power in all things corrupts absolutely. <laughs> Unless you are a person of uncommon wisdom and maturity, which I, I'm, not, I don't, I'm not now and I wasn't when I was 19, it's very hard not to bully a narrative when you write this way and to let un things unfold in due course. In other words, the narrator becomes more important than the story in a story written this way most of the time. And I'll tell you what, readers don't care about your narrator. Right? They only care about your story. Dickens could do it because he was Dickens, and because he was simply more interesting than most people. When he told me what to think, he was nearly always telling me something I was very glad to hear. I know that I am simply not smart or interesting enough to write this way. Maybe you are. God bless. All right? All right? But unless you're Dickens, walk away. Walk away from the bad idea. All right? Most, <laughs> most importantly, third-person omniscient narrative can create a degree of confusion in the reader's mind that is like nothing else I know of. It's simply because it has no rules about where or when to go, it's very easy to lose track, both you as the writer and the reader, right, of the source of language generation, where the language is coming from, anything that is inflected with opinion. Right? Consider that, that first sentence I just gave you. We're zooming all over the place, and it's only the first sentence of the story. But really, who thinks the day is fateful? Like, where does that come from? Is it Fred? I guess not. Is it the missus? Maybe she's the one with the hammer. <laughs> right? But we can't be sure. There's lots of uncertainty about the truth that happens. Even if, in, a, in an omniscient narrative, ironically, we are constantly uncertain about what the truth is. All right? Writing in third-person omniscience, I tell my students, is like splitting diamonds all day long. You simply can't ever blow it. And the truth is, you probably will. Third person limited, all right? Or CC, and CC is from James, and it stands for central consciousness, OK? This is by far the more manageable third person structure, and it's the one I use all day long. Here, the narrative is limited to naming the actions and experiences of one character. Just below the passage we just used is the same moment 
rendered in the manner of third person limited. Okay, the same fictive material. The, re the writer knows that Alicia is across town buying a hammer, right? Uh, but the story doesn't know yet. Fred, who fancied himself a clever man, even a brilliant man, stood in his yard and watered his petunias, feeling the warm sun on his shoulders, having a pleasant memory of the soft-boiled eggs he'd eaten for breakfast, sitting in the bright kitchen with his wife. I told you I was not going to confuse you with a good writing, all right? She was across town at work. He missed her poignantly. A black spot caught his eye on one of the petunias. He knelt to inspect it. Aha, he thought, fungus. <laughs> All right? So same moment, but we're missing half of it. No Alicia, no trips across town, except as Fred's mind reaches in that direction. We have no foreknowledge of the day ahead, no God, in other words, no memory of any days except as Fred has experienced them. The story is governed by his mind, and even suggests his language. He fancies himself a clever man, even a brilliant man. Britishisms, perhaps, maybe a little puffery. But either way, we start to dislike him a little for the way his mind operates. The narrator doesn't tell us he's an ass, but we're starting to get to see it for ourselves, which we, as readers, like. And if, indeed, Alicia's going to kill him with a hammer, it's nice if we have a sense of her motivation for doing so. All right? <laughs> The other thing to notice about this, and this is the most important thing, is the story is connected physically to Fred. Third Person Limited is as located in a, one character's physical experiences as first person is. So Fred's in the yard, the story's in the yard. Fred goes to the bathroom, the story goes to the bathroom. Fred goes upstairs, the story goes upstairs. It never goes somewhere that he isn't. Right? It can never be in two places at once. He looks left, the story looks left. He looks right, the story looks right. Okay? He physically owns the story, not just you know, cerebrally. <coughs> My wife is or used to be a poet, and once in a while she would put free verse aside in favor of something really rule-bound like the Sistina or the Villanelle. When I asked her why she did this, she told me it was freeing to have to work inside a structure. The poem could go interesting places, but it couldn't just go anywhere. Third Person Limited has much the same effect. In this passage, we have complete access to Fred, but only to Fred. His wife could be missing him as badly as he's missing her, or she could be buying a hammer with his name on it at this very moment. Fred doesn't know, so the narrator doesn't know, and so we don't know either. We may suspect everything's not as rosy as it should be. The fungus is a little suggestive, but all we have are our suspicions. Another word for this, and it's your friend as a writer, and this is what Third Person Limited is especially good at making, is suspense. It's very difficult to make an honestly suspenseful third-person omniscient narrative, right? The only way to create suspense and omniscience is to withhold information. Eventually, the readers feel like everybody knows everything but them, and it's annoying. Whereas in Third Person Limited, Fred has no idea. Right? Thus, the, the story doesn't know either that Alicia has, uh, <coughs> has designs against him. Now, Third Person Limited shifting, item C here, that's a name I kind of made up. It's actually just an extension of this principle, and I don't need to say too much about it. All it is is third person limited broken into discrete sections or chapters in which different central consciousnesses take turns. You can use this in a short story, but it's generally a little too bulky for a short story, uh, most, most short stories. It's usually a novelist's trope, right, Karen? You know? And uh, that's, that's, I, I include it here for, for, the, uh, for the novelists among you, which is quite a few. Uh, we are simply moving back and forth between different chapters from one character's consciousness to another using the information that one new character has to create a feeling of suspense or suspension about what the other characters know or don't know. So you move back and forth between minds, but you never do it inside the same narrative unit. You never do it inside a paragraph. You never even do it really inside a single chapter. Novels have chapters to formally separate these matters. A very good example of this, which I use often, is the novel Before and After by Rose Ellen Brown which was a huge bestseller in like 1993. So of course many people, it sort of drifted off the screen for many people, but it's a great novel. It's about a terrible crime that takes place. A uh, teenage boy murders his girlfriend, and this is like not a secret in the book. It happens in the first 10 pages. And the novel is uh, told in alternate sections from the points of view of the boy's father, the boy's mother, and his teenage sister, all of whom have different kind of feelings about what has happened. And as the family sort of breaks apart in the aftermath, of this crime, 
the story kind of moves back and forth between these different characters to give you kind of full-bodied sense of the whole family system in which this matter has, this crime has occurred. Right. The last item here, third person objective, right, um, is uh, something that probably most of you will never even try because it requires so much restraint and it really does feel sort of old-fashioned. It is once again told from the point of view of an independent or external narrator, but in this case the narrator makes absolutely no comment on the action and does not reveal the internal experiences of any of the characters directly. What we see in the story is only that which is observable through the five senses of somebody in the room. In other words, the story is entirely observed as if the reader were a kind of bystander. Now, everybody probably knows the answer to this question. What writer made the most extensive and formal use of this style of narration? It's probably on the sheet. It's Hemingway, okay? Yeah. Basically, he invented it, and he imported it, I think, into modernist fiction, really from his work as a newspaper reporter, and that's what it feels like. An instructive example would be his stories, Hills Like White Elephants, which many of you probably, uh, probably know. Um, it's on the, did I include a section of that on the handout from Hills Like White Elephants? Okay. I, this is, the third person objective is only instructive to, so you can see what's missing. I don't really encourage anybody to write in this form, but it shows you what has been taken out in a way that I think is really vibrant. The situation is this, uh, for those of you who don't know the story, two characters, a man and a woman, are drinking and talking at an outdoor cafe at a train station in rural Spain. The conversation drifts from idle chit-chat to something that seems more freighted, some operation that the, woman, the man wants the woman to have and she doesn't. The conversation is actually very hard to follow because the man and the woman, we know her name, which is Jig, but we don't know his because she never uses it, uh, are speaking a kind of private language. They're, they're lovers, they're intimates. And the narrator doesn't help us out at all. It's very much as if we're just simply sitting at the next table listening in, trying to de decir decipher something that's really none of our business. Right? has the quality of eavesdropping. So there's the sample passage, and you can see how it operates. It's very, very spare. They sat down at the table, and the girl, because that's what you would think of what she was based on observing her, looked across the hills on the dry side of the valley, and the man looked at her and at the table. So this has got all Hemingway's ticks in it. We've got to realize, he said, you've got to realize that I don't want to do it if you don't want to. I'm perfectly willing to go through with it if it means anything to you. Doesn't it mean anything to you? We could get along. Of course it does but I don't want anybody but you. I don't want anybody, anybody else, and I know it's perfectly simple, and so on and so on and so on. The entire story is built of conversation like this, and it's all perfectly confusing, and that is the point. Third objective basically turns the reader into a kind of detective, in this case forcing us to figure out on our own what these people are to each other, what their relationship is in a very specific sense, and what this thing is that the man wants the woman to do. It's a successful story very often, but the problem is you might get it wrong. When I've asked students to volunteer a theory about what it is, this operation, nearly always somebody, usually a boy wearing a baseball cap backwards, <laughs> suggests that he wants, her, him, he wants her to get a boob job. <laughs> Never mind that we're in Spain and it's like 1922. <laughs> The story for that young man is a lost thing. <laughs> so here's contrast, and this is why I like third person limited. You know, Hemingway's an interesting writer, and there are things of uh, virtue in his, in his writing, but I personally am attracted to something that puts at least one truth out on the table. All right, so here's the same passage, sort of rewritten as if it is from the point of view of a character. In this case, the woman, and I've given her a name, an actual name. I've called her Emily, and of course she knows her lover's name, so he has a name as well. And we are firmly inside her head, and we are physically attached to her, and she, of course, knows what the hell they're talking about. So we get at the same conversation differently. They sat down at the table, and Emily looked across at the hills on the dry side of the valley. Right? They were strangely beautiful to her, her opinion of them, lumpy and white, and she couldn't tell how far away they were, though she squinted her eyes and tried to guess. She turned and saw Ralph look at her, then shift his gaze to the table where their drinks sat. A little moment of cowardice. Emily suddenly didn't want to drink beer ever again in her life. Just the smell of it made her ill, though that could be something else, she realized. Already it's starting, she thought. You've got to realize, he said, in that pleading tone of his, we know who thinks it's pleading, Emily, that I don't want to do it if you don't want to. 
I'm perfectly willing to go through with it if it means anything to you. How awful, she thought, to speak of a child, their child, as it. He couldn't even use the word. But that's what he had to do, she understood, if he was going to talk her into having the abortion. All right? And so this is a story that doesn't conceal this, at least for very long. This is somewhere in the first 250 words of the story. Because it can't. The characters know what they're talking about. It would be a very different story. All right? It's just different from Hemingway's. I don't want to say one is better than the other. But you can really feel how third person, when you have access to one mind, becomes the story of that mind. All right? This is a story that takes Emily's side. It's kind of unclear in Hemingway whose side to take, as it's unclear, really, the first time you read it, what in the, the hell they're talking about. All right? The last item on the list, and I'm going to have to kind of speed it up, is this thing called first, second, combine, which is uh, the, the, the true um, bizarre high dive of narration. And I've seen it done a couple of times to just spectacular effects, so I do have to include it. I myself have never attempted it. I guess I don't feel up to it somehow. All right? Like second person, this is a very eccentric way to tell a story. I include it because it's possible. In essence, it is first person with a particular internal audience, right? though not in the formally specific manner of a letter that you find in first person epistolary. First person epistolary. Dear Karen. Right? This is Karen right? without the dear Karen in the front of it. All right? So there's both an I and a you. You, Karen. Right? who is, once again, a soldered being composed of the reader and an invented person. So it's a mixture of both certain of the, some of the tropes of first person and some of the structural tropes of second person without a salutation as in a letter. Okay? Um, I don't have time to write this on the board, so I'm just going to read it. Uh, maybe this is on your sheet. The sentence by George Garrett. Yeah, this is a wonderful story. It's in the book called An Evening Performance. A uh, collection of stories by the writer George Garrett, and it begins, Ray, old buddy, I'll never forget the look on your face when you came into the bedroom and found me there with your wife. <laughs> All right? And this is, you know, this is such a great sentence that the bar goes way up, you know? The story just has to be up to this, okay? But here's what happens in the story. First of all, it's a beautifully written story, and the, most thing, the thing you want to know right then is what happens next. So our interest in the text is the same as our interest in any kind of good story. What will happen when Ray comes into the room, right? And what happens, of course, is uh, that he sees them, he becomes very angry, and he says to his wife, who is that moment pinned beneath another man, okay? He says, honey, where's my gun, right? <laughs> To which she, after you know, 20 years of marriage you know, and all the habits that are implied therein, can only give an answer. Honey, I think it's in the top bureau drawer. <laughs> That's putting the narrator in a rather interesting spot. All right. It's a great story. I do recommend it. I think I even brought a copy for those of you who are curious. Okay? All right. But here's, you know, here's the question. Why is it being told this way? I mean, it's sort, of it's sort of built right into the narration right away. Why is the narrator talking to Ray about, A, some things Ray was there to see, B, some things he wasn't there to see. Um, why is it, what is the specific moment of this address? Like, where is this coming from? What has happened that he needs to talk to Ray about this? Right? And so in this case, Structure is more than something that cradles the story. Structure becomes the story. The basic dramatic question of the story. Why is it being told this way? Right? It sort of takes over other questions of character and fate within the narrative. I recommend giving this a whirl, but it will always create uh, that fundamental dramatic question. Why is it being told this way? OK, so now I have to really hit the gas and talk about the, this, the left side. All right, tenses and point of view. All right. <laughs> um, to do this, I have to go back and talk uh, a little bit about something I said before. Your narrator, whether in first or third, has all the properties of a mind, right? Whether it's somebody inside the story or somebody outside the story. So that narrative intelligence or person exists in time, right? They have a physical existence in time. And time, as survivors of my previous craft talk may recall, lives nowhere but where? Where is time located in your writing? Thank you. What? In the verbs, right? Yeah, the, 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 the warehouse of time in a sentence is the verb. There are other kinds of words that indicate time, and indicate sequence, little pieces of speech like you know, once upon a time and yesterday and, and you know, th that sort of stuff. But time is really created by your verbs, in, 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 partic in particular by your transitive action verbs, the verbs in which things happen. All right? That is the warehouse of time. So every story has a relationship to time that is established by the verb tense that you choose, the story's controlling tense. Every story has one. 
The controlling tense is the story's way of telling the reader the relationship between the story and its telling in time. The story and its telling are two different events. First person, third person, these are spatial relationships. Where is the telling located relative to the story? Where? This is when is the telling located relative to the story. The verb tenses tell us when it's told relative to when it happens. And this, friends, is where everybody screws up all the time. I used to say from time to time, but now it's, I see it's just like ubiquitous. As writers, you have basically three choices when it comes to controlling tenses. Present tense and two different kinds of past tenses. Present and then past historical and continuous. Present tense, I'll start there because it's easy and we can use it as a template for other things. Present tense is pretty much self-explanatory. In the interest of time, I will be brief with it. It graphically looks like this. Unfortunately, I have to write this on the board. Those lines are perfectly vertical. <laughs> you get the idea? OK? Present tense narrative, whether it's in first or th third, unfolds simultaneously with the action it describes. So event A is noted in telling moment one, and they occur right on top of each other. Right? There is no gap in time between the telling and the tale. Time difference is zero, space is zero. Its tendency is to create a feeling of velocity as a consequence. This happens, then this happens, then this happens, and so on. Time can be compressed or elided. It can be skipped over or summarized. But the major action of the story probably unfolds with an almost staccato feel to its telling and without much room for rumination. Characters are very much in the moment in such a story. For this reason, and it, this may be just a matter of taste, but I think it's not, it tends to work much better in third person than in first. In first person, present tense can come off as a little insane. <laughs> like a person who's muttering out a narration of his or her own life. <laughs> At the very least, it will come across as unnaturally self-aware. To see this in operation, I will direct you to the bad example on the handout, and I apologize for using my favorite fictive material, the Flintstone. <laughs> the Flintstones, okay? I'm standing on the corner when who do I see? Barney Rubble, my old friend from the gravel pits. Barney looks bad, too. It's been 10 years since I've seen him, and he's lost a lot of weight. As he approaches, I catch a whiff of something, an acrid odor like old fruit. He used to be a pretty together guy. 10 years ago, he wore some of the niftiest skins around. But I can tell you he's been in a bad skid since Betty left him. Maybe I'll go up and say hello. Now, it's got all the weaknesses and all the virtues of present tense right there, particularly in first person. But the thing to notice in this passage isn't really the present tense verbs. It's the verbs that aren't in present tense, but in past, and in this case, in simple past. The verbs of the major timeline, that is the story's events unfolding in order, are in present. But when the story goes into any kind of flashback, the verbs must recline one tense. Hence, 10 years ago, he wore some of the niftiest skins around. This sounds obvious, but it's actually very important, and you'd be surprised how often, even in published fiction, I see this done wrong. If the reader needs to have a solid sense of the stories unfolding in time, and the verbs indicate the pattern of this unfolding, then any errors that you make scramble the reality of the fiction. In other words, you get this wrong, and every, the camera suddenly blurs completely because the reader has to sort out chronology on their own. Mistakes are very difficult to make in present tense. That's why I started with it. Because you would be very disinclined to make a mistake of this nature when you were writing a present tense narrative. Unless right, you wanted to go back in time twice. Right? In other words, flashback within a flashback, which, which you do from time to time. The verbs, therefore, have to do just that. They have to go back twice. So go to the second example, which picks up where the last one let off. Same present tense narrative. One time, just after Betty had taken off with Mr. Slate, not took off, but had taken off, with Mr. Slate, Barney asked me over to his house. Until then, Barney had seemed to be taking his bad luck pretty much in stride. 
I had even seen him at our usual water buffalo meeting the week before. But when I got to his house, I could tell the change in him had begun, and it was no good. It was no good. So here's what happened. The major tense is present. Our narrator, Fred, then goes into flashback to a time when Barney asked him over to his house. When he does this, though, he gives us backstory relative to that moment. That's where he skips back twice. He set the clock at the moment when Barney asked him over to the house. Anything before that is double flashback. Flashback within a flashback. Thus, these verbs, just after Betty had taken off with Mr. Slate, Barney had seemed to be taking his bad luck in stride, and so on. So the story goes back. It says, relocates us at that moment, and then it skips back to give us additional backstory to that moment. You will do this all the time as writers, and it's something that you need to be aware of, and in fact, to be consciously aware of until your ear simply does the work for you. All right? Um, now, this gets a little trickier in past tense, actually. In present tense, this is pretty straightforward stuff, right? In past tense, but the principle is the same. Unfortunately, as I said, there are two kinds of past tenses, so we have to talk about them briefly. It's 10 o'clock. Can I get another, like, Five minutes? What do you think, Matt? Like five? Can I have five minutes? All right. All right. There's so two different kinds of past tenses, and this is, this is something you've got to understand as writers because it really is, it'll shape every word that you write. All right. The first kind of past tense is something called historical past tense. All right. And it works in first person narrative only, it doesn't work in third. All right. And it looks like this. The numbers on the left-hand side of the line indicate a sequence of events in a story, five things that happen in order in a story. Each event is recounted in order by a narrator who is remembering them, a first-person remembered story. All right? He's remembering them after the story is over. All right? This is the moment of the story's telling. The width of the gap between the telling and the tale is a defined interval. It could be an hour, it could be a day, or it could be 10 years, but it's defined and it's stable. The story might tell you how much is in that interval, and it might not, but it's there, and the writer knows it, and the narrator knows it. So even if the narrator doesn't choose to tell you, this happened 10 years ago, this happened yesterday, this happened last week, you as a writer need to know, because it will, in, the, in a sense, change and affect every word that you might write in the story, because it determines the quantity of hindsight. Those of you who were here two years ago when I did my riff on uh, John Cheever's reunion, that is the classic first person historical past tense story. The last time I saw my father was in Grand Central Station. It's a story remembered from a distance of like 20 years, a guy remembering the last time he saw his father who was a boorish drunk. They go to four restaurants and each restaurant his dad behaves worse and worse. The son gets on a train and never sees him again. Okay? First person historical past tense narrative. There's a second type, though, of, of past tense narration, and it's usually associated with third person, but it, there's no reason it can't work in first either. Now, in this past tense, the telling and the tale are actually both in motion. This one, the telling is stable, it doesn't move. It exists a week, a year, 10 years later. All right? In, third, in uh, continuous past tense, though, the telling and the tale are both in motion. In other words, these lag right just behind. Right. I'm a terrible artist. So. This is a little gap, a little triangle. Once again, the letters, this I didn't put letters on here, A, B, C, D, E. Right? The letters are the events in the story, top line, the events of the story. Bottom line, the moments of their telling. In each case, an interval of imaginary smallness has passed between the two, a kind of continuous unfolding agoness in the story. Structurally, such a story behaves a lot like present, except for the presence of this little gap. Right? Each moment in the story, each verb in the story identifies something that just happened. 
The gap, as I say, is small. It's not even something you could properly measure with time, but it's also kind of an infinite bag. It's a hole in time into which the narrator can put anything at all. Once again, I give you the Flintstones, right? The last example, okay? This is a past tense narrative, right? Fred, third person, central consciousness, in this continuing agonist tense. Fred opened the door and stepped into the clean white light of Barney's hospital room. Barney was sitting in a chair by the window, his face darkened in shadow. He seemed not to notice that anyone had entered, and Fred wondered if perhaps Barney was asleep. But his eyes were open. They stared blank and glassy at nothing, at the world outside the window, the parking lot, the lilting blue hills beyond. For a moment, Fred just stood there, remembering his old friend. Then Barney turned his head and looked at Fred. A thin smile crossed his lips. Hey, Fred, he said, because that's what Barney always says, OK? <laughs> All right. Each moment in that story, each verb has the opportunity to open like a kind of infinite bag or kind of accordion, right, into which the internal experiences of Fred, all of his memories, because he's our central consciousness, all his hopes, all his wishes, and all the physical sensations of his exterior and interior experience can be put, right? Thus, this is, in some ways, the most attractive way to tell the most stories, because it gives you the mediating presence of a narrator, thus allowing you to tell a story from anybody's point of view, and it gives you an infinite bag into which to tuck the full richness of their experience. I had one other thing to do, which is a kind of trick, and uh, I, I really, I don't have time, and it's, it's, a, it's a way of adjusting your verb tenses to do something called foregrounding the flashback. Those of you who are lucky enough to be in my class will get this in the next 20 minutes. But anyway, mysteries of point of view revealed. Thank you very much.